right, good afternoon. Um, I'm Julia Cho uh, from FDA, Office of Study Integrity and Surveillance. And the talk of, uh, uh, the title of my talk is going to be Blinding During Bioequivalence Trial. So you may be wondering, why specifically am I talking about blinding during bioequivalence trial? And I think that's a very good question. What's special about it? So in order to answer that question, we need to first out, uh, find out what the bioequivalence trials are. So let me ask one question here. How many of you, uh, you here are familiar with bioequivalence or bioequivalence studies? That's great. For some reason, people on this side have more exposure than this side. So maybe I should turn this way to start talking about. Well, so I'm going to just introduce my agenda, uh, which I'm going to start with what is a bioequivalence trial? And I think that would be helpful for the people who hasn't been exposure to that. And how the uh, blinding codes play a role in bioequivalence uh, studies. Then I'm going to talk about how does FDA inspection uh, look like in terms of uh, inspecting those studies. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of case examples that involves bioequivalence studies. And then I'm going to end with closing uh, thoughts. So first, bioequivalence. What is bioequivalence? Uh, in code of uh, uh, federal regulation, the definition is absence of a significant difference in the rate and extent to which the active ingredient or active moiety in pharmaceutical equivalents or pharmaceutical alternatives become available at the site of the reaction when administered at the same molar dose under similar conditions, and et cetera, and et cetera. So, how does this sound? This sounds very convoluted, doesn't it? So let me put it more simple way. So in the layman's term, what bioequivalence means is a demonstration of the sameness when two drug com uh, products are compared. Um, and this is very important because it is a fundamental basis for a generic drug approval, where all they need to be shown is your generic drug is equivalent to the innovator drug, which has been exposed to a lot of testing prior to their approval. For the new drug side, the use of bioequivalent studies are a bit less. But nonetheless, it is sometimes used, especially when cases like there is a formulation changes during the clinical development phase. In that case, a sponsor of the innovative drug do need to perform a bioequivalence to show that those formulation changes are not changing the clinical efficacy. So, um, how or what other ways that bioequivalent studies can be conducted? The regulation allows both in vitro studies or in vivo uh, uh, assays. Now, for today's my talk, I'm going to uh, focus my talk on in vivo clinical trials. The most common way of uh, uh, bioequivalent studies are pharmacokinetic uh, based endpoint based uh, bioequivalent study. And it is because in the most cases, the drug efficacy is believed to be correlated to the concentration of drug in our systemic circulation. Therefore, bioequivalence is measured, uh, is, is uh, demonstrated by measurement of drug concentration in biological samples collected at various time points after the drug is given. And typically, this is a single dose, randomized study, and it is typically open label study. Therefore, blinding is not usually a matter for this PK endpoint B study. But in some other cases, when the drug efficacy is not well reflected by drug concentration in the blood circulation, the sponsor has to conduct a clinical endpoint B study. And in these cases, um, the B is determined by evaluation of clinical efficacy, just like those uh, clinical studies that we heard on uh, the whole day today. And uh, the examples where clinical endpoint B studies are applicable includes when the drug is not intended for systemic absorption, some of the topical uh, presentation local acting drug, such as treatment for, let's say, acne or psoriasis type of drug. These uh, clinical endpoint studies are uh, typically multiple dose, uh, randomized, and uh, blind, uh, double blind study. So those IMP, or investigational drug, medical drug, is delivered to the clinical site with some kind of a randomization code or randomization number 
So this identity of drug um, that Gail and uh, Jean talked about is not known to the investigator or the study subject. And um, the study subjects are given those drugs uh, based on the randomization number that's pre-planned during the study uh, planning stage. So then how do you know what drugs are what? And that's where blinding codes uh, come in play. So the blinding codes provide a link between the randomization number uh, assigned to each kit with actual treatment identity. And there are several different ways that blinding code can be prepared. And I included some of the examples here. Um, the first is a scratch of label. This is the most conventional and commonly used form of a blinding, uh, at least uh, uh, in the current uh, time. And it's just like a lottery ticket. You scratch off uh, the label, and you find the answer of the drug behind that. Then there is a sealed envelope. The blinding code is provided in an envelope that's sealed so that the recipient doesn't know, uh, do not know the identity of the drug. It usually comes with the uh, shipment that gets delivered to the site of the medical drug, uh, product, but then sometimes it can be uh, separately mailed as well. And this uh, sealed envelope should remain same uh, sealed uh, during the study um, period and until the study is completed, unless there are uh, specific occasions where the blind needs to be uh, broken. Then interactive a voice and web responsive system we just heard a few minutes ago. And um, these days and ages, there are more and more stuff done electronically. And uh, randomization and blinding for clinical trial so not an exception. And we are certainly seeing this type of trend for DE trials as well. So how should the blind encoder should be handled? Um, so FDA's expectation of blind encoder was first mentioned in uh, 1993 in a federal register which announces the uh, final rule for reserve sample requirements for the uh, bioequivalent trial. Then later in 2004, it was further clarified in FDA guidance for industry handling and retention of a bioavailability, bioequivalence testing samples. And I'm going to read the phrases there. For blind study, we recommend that the study sponsor and or drug manufacturer provides a testing facility, a sealed code for use by FDA, should it be necessary to break the code. And then it goes on to uh, say, uh, the sealed code should be maintained at the testing facility. So this is all he says. Well, it's not too long. It's a very kind of brief uh, statement here. And um, if, uh, if we think about, well, even though it's a brief, it doesn't have a lot of detail what we are expecting about the, uh, the sealed code. If you think about the intent of this passage, and uh, especially in uh, terms of data integrity, it should be kind of self-evident for us that what we are saying here is that the sealed code should be supplied to the clinical site before the study starts so that there won't be any potential changes that we might be suspecting later on. Um, more recently, in actually this year, 2018, in May, we also uh, uh, announced an updated bio-research monitoring compliance program 7348003. Essentially, it is a uh, kind of a guide to our investigators how to conduct a DE uh, inspection. It is a document that's available to public so that you can actually all go and see. Um, it describes a, a important detailed uh, instructional, uh, instructions for the inspection procedures. And of course, it includes the part that is uh, going to be used for randomization and, and blinding verification. So how does FDA inspection uh, look like? Of course, there are many aspects of clinical uh, study conduct um, that FDA investigator uh, covers during inspection. But from the blinding and unblinding randomization point of view, these are some of the things that I listed here. So when we go there, we evaluate that the blinding was uh, properly maintained throughout the study per protocol, um, which is what we talked about. There are multiple ways it can go wrong, so we, we ensure that. We review subject's doting record that's uh, maintained at the site and unblind the treatment using the dose record and verify 
that the subject actually received the correct treatment as was recorded in the submission. Uh, remember, think about that. The bioequivalency is to very demonstrated two drugs are working the same. So we really wanted to make sure that the subject who was assigned for test did receive test drug, and the subject who received uh, who were assigned to a reference drug did indeed uh, receive a, a reference drug. So otherwise, if there is any mix-up, whether it's a kind of mistake or maybe some other reason, some other motivations, if there are mix-up, then um, the, the data will show artificially the two treatment effects are the same when actually they may not be. And there cannot be a really good basis for a, a, a approval of a generic drug. So I'm going to move on to uh, present you with the first case. The study was a multi-center, randomized, double-blind pharmacodynamic study comparing Innovator's inhalation product, a generic version. There were seven clinical sites involved for the study, out of which we inspected three sites. The study utilized a the conventional tier of label that was attached to the investigational product. And as the subjects were uh, dosed, the site placed that uh, dosing record, uh, that the tier of part, uh, part to the dosing um, record, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, we learned that through the inspection that sponsors uh, study monitor uh, after the study completion collected the original dosing record and the clinical site only maintained the uh, photocopy. And during the inspection, uh, the sponsor learned that there is an FDA inspection. Therefore, the sponsor decided to return back those uh, dosing records they have taken earlier. So what's shown here is a photocopy of a dosing record that was retained in the clinical site that our investigator found out. And this is the one that span original that sponsor took and brought it back for an inspection. And well, as you can see, interestingly, there are some letters shown on the left-hand panel side, which is a photocopy that the site uh, retained that wasn't present in the original version, which, increased, uh, which uh, raises an interesting question. So there are some issues from this inspection that we found. Um, first, the sponsor could not, uh, have, uh, could not provide all the dosing records they have taken. So they took the original, but when we are asking for verification, there are a few uh, missing records so that we couldn't really verify. The second aspect is that, as we talked about a few minutes ago, FDA guidance recommends the sealed code uh, to be maintained at the testing facility. And it is really important in situations like this, where some differences are noted between the original and the photocopy, and from data integrity point of view. And also, there are some discrepancies, which I'm going to describe in a few minutes, that the FDA investigator, uh, uh, when the FDA investigator was trying to unblind the scratch of label to verify the subject received the right treatment as reported. So the left column is a treatment identity based on the dosing record that the sponsor provided back to the site for inspection. And they were labeled as ABCDE code and those are treatment identity. And what's on the right column is the one that uh, treatment ID per protocol. And as you can see, there are significant differences between the one that was returned back as opposed to what uh, the subjects were given. So that raises some concerns. Because of these differences and discrepancies in treatment ID and blinding codes between the uh, sponsor returned closing record and the study protocol, we are left with the question of can we be sure what, uh, who received, which subject received what? And uh, what about data integrity? Is there any data integrity concerns? So I'd like just to mention again that FDA's expectation uh, is the blinding code remained at the clinical site throughout the duration of the study until FDA inspection. So this is the next case example that I'm trying to share. This is, was a randomized, double-blind, parallel, uh, parallel group study to determine local equivalence of innovators in the generic drug product 
in adult asthma patients. In this case, they have used interactive voice response system for randomization and treatment assignment. During inspection, uh, we found that, that the clinical site received a sealed envelope that we talked about earlier that contains a blinding code. But it turns out that this record, the blinding code record, was generated and sent to the clinical site after the study was uh, finalized. Therefore, it wasn't really useful for its purposes in verifying which subject uh, received, uh, whether the subject received the right treatment because it was generated after the study was analyzed and all things have been analyzed. So in order to verify, we asked them about the access to the IVR system, but the site did not have access to the IVR system because they said the study was completed and the sponsor took the right back, the rights to the access to the system back. Therefore, FDA investigator was not able to access the IVR system or its uh, audit trail to verify what activities are, was done so that we couldn't really verify who received what. However, during the inspection, uh, FDA investigator was able to review the subject dispensing log, which was maintained at the site. And that included the randomization number for the subject uh, that they were assigned to and the kin number that they were given to. And then we worked with the CEDAR review division, and the sponsor of the applicant provided a material schedule. And this material schedule provides a link between the kin number, the IP number, with actual drug ID during the manufacturing and during the packaging. And what was good was that this document that they provided had a timestamp that uh, is involved with that particular activity. And we were able to verify that the packaging and the material schedule was created before the study started. So by linking the kin number and the dispensing log maintained at the site, with those in the material schedule that sponsor later provided with a timestamp were good to be uh, good so that we could match whether the treatment, the subject treatment was correctly done as reported. And in addition to that, the treatment ID was consistent with the randomization schedule, which kind of increased our confidence about, yes, the, the reported data was actually uh, reliable. So uh, in my short talk, in closing, um, I'd like to mention that the, one of the critical uh, determinants for an approval of a generic drug is demonstration of bioequivalence. Therefore, verification of who got what, whether it's test, reference, or placebo, is really centerpiece in determining bioequivalence and the data integrity of those studies. So I'd like to end my talk by reminding all of us that protecting the blind and appropriate handling of blinding codes help assuring the integrity of those B studies. Thank you.